Amen. God bless you. Welcome to Destiny Center this morning. Coming to you from Delta, British Columbia. I'm Glenda Dubain. And um, I just want to share with you this morning just how, you know, during this season, there's just so much. It seems to be people are in a lot of turmoil and, and just like an invisible war kind of going on, you might say. And, and, you know, I believe it's a battle for our minds. I really do. And, you know, it's intense and it's unrelenting. And it seems to come at people from a lot of different ways. And, you know, it's not fair because guess what? Our enemy, Satan, doesn't play fair, does he? And the reason why it's so tense is that it's, our mind is, is one of the greatest assets that we have. And so I faced, um, I guess in my life and, and around about me with family and different things, um, I faced mental illness close up. And I've seen what it's like when people are unable to hear God because their minds are broken and because they can't seem to connect to God even when they want to connect to God. And I know that whatever um, uh, gets your mind gets you. And that's how important our mind is. So some of the most important things we need to learn and teach is how to guard our minds how to strengthen, how to renew our minds in this time because the battle for sin always starts in our minds. And there's a lot of passages of scripture we can go through the word and we'll go through today. But I want to start out at, at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, if you have that there. And uh, it says, though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, we don't fight with armor, we don't fight with you know politics, we don't fight with with our money, we don't fight with you know all the humanistic ways, because it says the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion against raised against the knowledge of God. And we're to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so the Apostle Paul is saying here that our job in this battle is to destroy strongholds. And you know what a stronghold is? It's, it's a mental block. And Paul's talking about our imaginations, arguments set up against the knowledge of God. And it's a mental battle. And he says, destroy these strongholds. So a stronghold can be, it can be like a, a view that we've taken, maybe a mindset, uh, maybe a, uh, like maybe materialism or secularism or communism, whatever it is. It's like we get this mindset, atheism, and different isms, right? You might say <laughs> they become mental strongholds. And people, they set them up in their minds against the knowledge of Christ. And a stronghold can also be a personal battle. It can be worry. Worry can be a stronghold. Uh, seeking the approval of other people can be a stronghold. Or anything that makes an idol in your life can be a stronghold. Whether it's fear or guilt or insecurity, whatever it is, all of these things can be strongholds in our mind. And the Bible says that we're to tear these things down, taking every thought captive. It says to oh, the obedience of Christ, Take every thought captive. And that there's a Greek word, uh, I'll probably slaughter the pronunciation, I can mal over something. And it means to control, <laughs> it means to control, to conquer, to bring into submission. So we take captive and we make it submit. Every thought obedient to Christ. We make it obedient. And to, it means that, like I'm saying, to bring it under submission and under control. But how do you do that? How do you make your mind, mind? <laughs> how do you make your mind line up? Um, I've noticed that my mind doesn't always want to do what I want it to do. Uh, sometimes it's, it's dif disobedient. <laughs> it can be very rebellious at times, right? Uh, there was a caption I saw someone put on, on Facebook, I think, something about, if we could see the bubble that was about everybody's <laughs> thought, no. that would be really <laughs> scary with it. <laughs> I'd have Imagine to keep my wife in the house. If you would look around and see exactly what everybody was thinking. Okay, pretty scary, I think, sometimes. I don't think we want to do that. Um, but, you know, sometimes we want to think a certain way, and our mind wants to go another way. And, you know, and we, we wander, don't we? I mean, even right now, as we're sitting 
here even listening, every one of you have got different thoughts. Some of you are probably thinking about, you know, what you're going to have for lunch, and some of you are thinking that you're hungry, or you're hot, or you're cold, or whatever. Um, but, you know, we, or our thoughts begin to float away when we're trying to concentrate on something. We start to, like, think about something else. But the battle for sin, okay, always starts in our mind. Yeah. And Paul talks about this in Romans 7. And he says, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Wretched man that I am. That's in Romans 7, 19 and 24. And so we need to learn how to fight the battle of our mind if we want to be uh, victorious, powerful, and effective in our walk with God. Amen? And one of the... Um, things that the enemy uses to come at us is difficulties, right? And we do okay on uh, many, until many things start to go wrong, and then we start to kind of cave in. And when you face difficulties, every time we face a difficulty, we face a choice, right? To believe in God or to believe what the enemy's doing. And so these attacks are, are going to come on our life, Okay, so we need to be ready for these things. And, you know, 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13 says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. I was sharing this last week. When it comes upon you to test you, as so though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice in so far as to share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And so how can you rejoice in suffering? You know, I find... Um, this hard, you know, sometimes because we're not to maybe rejoice in what we're suffering, but rejoice in your suffering in faith, knowing that God is working all things for good. Amen? So that you can choose so that life's, you know, either the difficulties either mount up in your life, or you can choose to see the great things that God is doing through each one of them. We always have a choice when we come to those places in our life. And John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so many people right now are facing some difficulties. And, um, you know, and if you're not careful, these things begin to affect your mindset. And you can be overwhelmed or you can choose to try over it. And we have a choice as Christians, amen? The next thing that the enemy tries to do is bring disobedience to us. Um, disobedience or sin becomes a battle in our minds, doesn't it? And if you knowingly sin and don't repent, then it opens a door to allow Satan to attack your mind. You know, it's a different day. I mean, we're all going to sin and fall short. We're not angelic beings, are we? But if we knowfully continue to sin and don't repent, then it opens a door. And then sin takes away the hedge of protection, God's protection, and opens the door for the enemy to be able to come through and attack you. Psalm 81, 11, and 12 says, But my people did not listen to my voice, Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. So God's judgment on our sin is like when he takes his hands off the wheel. You know, we sing that song, Jesus, Take the Wheel, where we want Jesus to take over our life and, and be the Lord of our life. But when we knowingly sin and don't repent, then he takes his hands off the wheel and lets us reap what we are sowing. And that's kind of a dangerous place to be because... Um, if you want to win the battle for your mind, you got to stop uh, sinning and be obedient to the Lord. You have to come into that place of, of repentance. And sometimes repentance is, can be all the time, right? 24-7. And the other thing that the enemy can throw at us is discouragement. And a lot of times um, you might not be in sin, um, but the things that you're going through, the difficulties, can bring you to a place of discouragement. And the enemy loves to discourage, wear us down, um, because he knows when he can wear on us like that, like a nail file that's just wearing us down, it becomes, it begins to impoverish us, and it affects every area of our life. And Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred 
makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so uh, when what you hope for and what you're working for and what you long for, when it gets deferred, okay, I mean, when time goes on and you don't see a fulfillment of it, um, it's like discouragement just comes in. It can come in as a result of it. And it's easy to get depressed in our negative world, isn't it? I bet you don't have to look too far around to find someone that you know that is suffering from depression right now. We live in a very negative world. You know, all you have to do is turn on your TV and it's gonna tell you all the bad news of what's going on, isn't it? <laughs> so it's easy to turn that TV off. And how things are getting worse and worse. And even some Christians and even some ministries are focusing on the negative instead of what God is going to do in the midst of it. Amen? Amen. But God is not, in, in the midst of all of this, God's not asking us to live in denial or live in a bubble. But in the midst of a chaotic world, the Holy Spirit fills us with joy and peace so we can literally abound with hope in our heart. And, you know, I found a story, I was, I was just reading about hope, and, and this uh, testimony came up about um, having a strong anchor in the storm. And it said, back in uh, 2003, it said there was a massive earthquake that hit Algeria. And the earthquake measured 6.8 6 on the Richter scale and killed over 1,000 people. And it said 150 miles away, there was a yacht anchored in Porto Pedro Bay in Morocco, Spain. And it was hit by a, the violent <coughs> aftershocks of this earthquake. And it said the yacht was buffeted fiercely by the waves, as were 10 other yachts that were moored nearby. Now all 10 of those yachts were ripped from their mooring and crashed into one another and into the rocks of the harbor, totally destroying each one of them. This is 150 miles away from the epicenter. But one that one yacht's anchor held firm for two hours as it was being lashed by the waves. Moored by a new kind of anchor and a cable system, the strongest anchor ever designed for a private yacht. And because of these special design and strength of that anchoring system, it says the yacht and everyone on board was saved from death. And so as Christians, we use, you know, Christianese that we talk about, you know, the storms of life, and we talk about these things that, that we're going through. And we go through storms. And Ephesians 4.14 uses that kind of, same kind of language. It's talking about immature people whose hearts are not rooted in sound doctrine. And it says they get tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, every wind of teaching, right? They're just here one day and here there the next day on their, um, the way they see things because they're just believing everything and they get tossed to and fro. James 1, 6 says, he, it says the same thing. It says, uh, if someone is doubting God's promises, it says, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because those who doubt are like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And people should not think they're gonna receive anything from God if you are double-minded, right? It says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so we see also in, in Hebrews 6.13, uh, God, it says, God wants to give us Jesus as the anchor. He talks a lot about, you know, boats and winds and waves and, and uh, uh, as analogies, but Jesus is our anchor. And it says, we have an anchor that holds within the veil. And we sang even this morning, right? As we face trials that come against our faith, our anchor is going to hold us close to Christ. Because we can get hit by waves of trials and temptations, can't we? And we can get assaulted by um, maybe a guilty conscience or by accusations of the enemy. We can get assaulted by, you know, any kind of sickness or pain or, you know, lots of different struggles and stuff. But God wants us to know that we are firmly anchored to him through Jesus Christ and that he's not going to let go of us through the finished work of Christ on the cross and by the strength of his ongoing priestly ministry for us behind the veil, 
right? That's what the Lord does. He's our chief intercessor. That's what Jesus is. He goes before the Father on our behalf. And it says, and we sing that song, song Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong, the Savior's love. And through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. And it says, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. You're probably wondering, what, what is that? My anchor holds within the veil. The anchor of Christ that we have with Christ, it holds within the veil. And, you know, we are securely tied to God. Amen? And that's a great promise. And, and you, know, um, you know, you might maybe be feeling like your life uh, was like that the yacht <laughs> that was drifting away and getting smashed by all kinds of winds and waves. And, you know, um, because maybe you're going through some trials right now in your life. Maybe some, maybe it's not that bad, but you're wondering, you know, when the next trial is going to come. Like people are dreading even the future of these uncertain times. Um, and a lot of times we can, we, we can live our life waiting for the, you know, so to speak, the other shoe to drop, you know, as people would say. And, and you hear things about what's going on in other people's lives, and we can live in fear. We can live in fear of things that haven't even come our way yet. People have got themselves in just a place, you know. But God wants us to be filled with hope. And he wants us to be filled with hope every day. And that's um, something that the world doesn't have. Because we have it in Christ, amen? amen? And God gets glorified in our life when we're moving in a place of hope and faith. And when we're filled with hope, it's like the Lord gets glorified, and it's like it's a buoyancy that happens to our spirit. I don't know, if I, you know that's the picture I get of, of buoyancy. And, you know, so what? Like, what is hope? And I think kind of hope, kind of um, like... Um, the buoyancy is like kind of a life jacket in a way, you know. Um, you can't, or the enemy can't get you down, okay? You're going to be shoved down, but you're going to like pop back up again, right? Um, I feel like, you know, sometimes, you know, those punching bags, I don't think they have them anymore, but, you know, back in the day, you fill the bottom with sand, and then the kids would like bop them, right? And they'd go over and they pop right back up again. Well, you know, I feel sometimes like that in the spiritual realm. I don't think I'm by myself, amen? <laughs> you know, where sometimes you just are going along, and poof, you take a hit, and you might be thrown for a minute, but you know what? I'm coming back stronger, amen? I'm not going to let that thing get me down. And, uh, you know, I just remember just swimming in the nice, salty oceans of Hawaii. I'd love to be there right now. Um, or except to America or wherever, you know? these, you know. But when you get in that salty ocean, it's like you just float, you know? You can just float for hours. It's like you try to go dive down snorkel or something, it's like you're burning, you're right back up again. Because it's buoyant, isn't it? Just you can't you can't you can't get down with when it's buoyant like that. And um, I was floating uh, yeah just yeah I can see myself just floating there right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Jen let's, let's with, take a moment. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Jen who's in Hawaii right now. Um, but I remember with all the uh, the boating that I've done in my life, just the importance, you know, of wearing a life jacket. And, you know, when you're thrown into the water, you know, you automatically float. And that's a good thing. You know, if you get thrown off a tube or wipe out water skiing or whatever you're doing, you're buoyant. And, you know, we were boating even this summer in the middle of the lake. And, you know, we cut the engine and we all jumped off. And it was a really windy day. And we didn't really realize how windy it was until we got out there. And I'm glad I grabbed a, a noodle on my way overboard. But uh, it was so windy that... By the time we turned around, the boat was there and we were back there. And it was a long way away. And I'm just thankful that, you know, there was a rope that they could throw us to get us back to the boat. You know, because it was drifting like really fast. But, you know, um, I think that's where the Christians are though. Like we, where we don't tie ourselves to the promises of God um, and have that, you know, buoy you might say or <laughs> to keep us up and lift it up we begin to sink because we're not clinging we're not clinging to the hope of christ and the promises of god and i really think the hope is like that buoyancy and it's like our life jacket and it's more than just being optimistic it is having a hope for your future and so i think you know everyday life you know um 
whatever human life that, you know, there's, there's different types of hope that we can look at. There's, um, it all has to do with future things, right? Good things in the future that we don't have yet. And, you know, there's short-term hope, and there's long-term hope, and there's eternal hope. And short-term hope is like, um, you know, things are looking really good for the rest of the day, right? And, you know, you're going to go out to your favorite restaurant maybe, have lunch, have some friends over, and you look forward to that. It's going to be a good time. You get excited. Um, when is this past trip we're going to get done yapping up here? Because <laughs> you want to go out and you want to enjoy this nice day, right? Um, and then there's the expectation that... Um, the next day or so is, is going to be good. So short-term hope. And long-term hope is looking at maybe like the rest of your life, okay? The rest of your life is going to look good. You know, you look at your life and what's going on in your life. And you're, you know, anticipating good things. And um, you're ex ex anticipating a fruitful life and a good life. And, and it's kind of the, I always think of it as kind of like uh, looking at the hope of a new married couple, right? You know, they just get married and they drive off onto their honeymoon and it's like, the sky's the limit as to what they think is ahead for them, right? That they're, um, they just are going to have this great life together, enjoy their, their time. It's going to be awesome. And they're anticipating only good things, right, for the rest of their life. And then there's eternal hope. And it has to do with life after death, doesn't it? It has to do with death itself, what will happen when you die. And if you have a hope that is eternal, that after you die, there is a place that we know as Christians, amen, that we're going to go to, and that's heaven. And you'll be welcome there, received there, and it's going to be awesome and wonderful, and you can't wait to be there. And that's eternal hope, amen? And the Bible says that people without Jesus are without hope and without God in the world. And they might be looking forward to what's going on for the rest of the day, but the future looks really dim. They're depressed. They've seen bad things happen, or maybe things haven't worked out in their life. Maybe their marriage hasn't worked out. Maybe their businesses have failed. Whatever's happened, maybe they've lost their job or their home, and um, they've just been beaten down, and they are not in a good place. And I even think about what we've seen in our own city. Um, you know, you look at people, you know, we see that there's 10 cities, and you know, uh, and I think, you know, if I'm living there, what does my long-term hope look like? You know, the political situations in our nations, the economic future is uncertain. You know, the greatest hope that we have is just to say, Lord, get them out of there. You know, the people that are living in the tent cities, right? Just begin to pray for them that they would have a place to go, amen? That they would not be living like that. Um, and I think um, it's just our political arena. You know, we need to pray for our leaders, amen, in these uncertain times. Because truly, you know, apart from God, we can do nothing, amen? Like even in our uh, ideas and the things that God is going to give us creative ideas how to get out of these situations. And so how can... Um, We, God can come with the Word of God and minister us in all of these areas of hope. And especially eternal hope as Christians. That is something that we have. It's, um, and when you have those, you can, you, we begin to, um, we can rest in the Lord. Amen? Knowing that He is working, even though we don't see that He's working. He is working in our life. And we have a destiny and eternal purpose. And so we, as Christians, we shouldn't allow ourselves to become hopeless. You know, that's not the mark of a Christian, amen? We should feel the hope. We should feed it, you know? Um, and the text shows us how to do it. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And the hope in, in Hebrews 11 are people, it's talking about people who are looking forward, okay? They were looking ahead to... A city with a foundation, whose foundation was God, and in Hebrews, and says that's eternal hope. And because of that, they uh, were living their life with that kind of expectancy. But you know, some of us may have battled for a long time, and you know, maybe you've been hoping for a breakthrough, and, and maybe you are discouraged, and maybe you've been asking God and, and believing for 
you know, maybe a loved one to be saved or your business a breakthrough there, but maybe it hasn't happened yet. And, you know, discouragement can lead to doubt. It can lead to doubt in our heart. And, you know, that's kind of the next process. If we don't renew our mind, that we can come into a place, after we get discouraged, we can come into a place of doubting God. And doubt becomes the opposite thing of faith. I've heard that little cliche that says, doubt knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. Amen? So when we have faith, it is going to knock doubt out. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and if you get enough, you know, hits or attacks, I guess, on your life, and enough troubles, discouragement, enough bad experiences, doubt can start to rise up instead of faith in our heart. And that doubt, it tosses us back and forth, doesn't it? James 1.6, it says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And I just pray that if some of you are experiencing doubt right now, that you know that you would know that there's a battle going on for your mind. You know, you try to maybe you try to believe God, but doubt comes in and overwhelms you. If that's the case, then the enemy is starting to win. And it's time to rise up and renew our minds. Amen. Another assault that the enemy can throw at us is, is the, the wounds or the hurts or the pains that we go through. Because as we go through things, um, uh, you know, we're going to experience hurts at some point in our lives, right? But we need to bring these things to the Lord and ask his forgiveness for our, our um, maybe even for our lack of forgiveness to other people that may have hurt us. Amen? And if we don't do this, these hurts can become very deep within our hearts and we can bury them and we can stuff them in and they become ingrained into our minds and um, they are areas where the enemy can come in and attack. You know, Hebrews 12, 14 to 15 says, it says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. And you know, so when someone hurts us, regardless of you know whether who's right or wrong, if you hold on to that unforgiveness, it's going to grow into bitterness and defile your mind. And it gives the enemy a chance to come and attack and try to defeat you. And so I just put it out there today that, you know, maybe some of you just need to, to look inward and say, God, is there places where I just need to forgive? Because unforgiveness will destroy your mind and allow the enemy that foothold. You know, like I've said before, unforgiveness is like that poison that we, um, it's like you're drinking poison, hoping the other guy dies. And so whether you're right or wrong, we need to, you know, forgive and move on, have that, um, fast repentance in our heart. And then deception can come in. And that's in, <laughs> deception, you know, in this age of uh, selfie, right, of uh, the me-isms, and for people, you know, life is all about them. You know, advertising, you know, it's like, uh, drink this beer and you'll be cool. You know, wear this lipstick and, and you're gonna be, you know, um, you'll be great. And, you know, whatever, drive this car, use this deodorant, whatever it is, use this phone. The best iPhone is out now and a new one, and it's all about you and what you want. But you can't think that this is all true because, you know, um, and there's, you know, people that are pouring money into a lot of scams, and there's people, you know, working long hours for just money, 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 and they just get on this gerbil wheel of life, and they start to just you know, let go and neglect the things that are really, really important. And they get blinded by the enemy and they can't even see the truth about who they are and their need for the Lord in their life anymore. And it says that in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and 5. It says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And so we need to, as, as Christians, it says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you need to be the servant of all. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And not be self-centered, not be full of, of yourself. And um, 
But you know, these are all things where the enemy can come at our minds, amen? But it doesn't end there, because this is, because God gives us victory as Christians, amen? amen. And, and there's some ways that we can win the battle of our minds. I don't know about you, but you know, when you learn this, you realize that you can walk in victory, amen? And uh, there's a lot, the Word of God says a lot about strengthening our minds, about renewing our mind, about submitting our mind, bringing our thoughts into captivity. And there's like, I don't know, there's like over 100 principles in God's Word that have to do with what we're to do with our minds. You know, and I said before, our, our mind is our, our, like our greatest asset that God has given us. And so that's why you see even an assault in this day and age on the amount of people that are dealing with some kind of mental illness. I guess un, it, it's really sometimes unbelievable, you know, how many people are affected right now. And so one of the ways that uh, we can win the battle of our mind, you might say, is, is we can't believe everything that we think. And we, you know, we, we a lot of times feel like, okay, well, if we think something, it has to be true because it came from within us, right? And so just because you think something doesn't make it true. And like I said before, like I've seen the face of mental illness. And, you know, there could be many different things that come into our minds, right? And the world can put suggestions into our mind uh, that are false, and we get bombarded with those, those false ideas all the time. And Satan, he comes and he makes suggestions, false suggestions all the time too. And there's, you know, in the Word of God, like if you want to just, you know, jot these scriptures down, we're not going to look them up today, but it talks about, um, about a dozen different places for the condition of our minds under sin. It says we can have a confused mind in Deuteronomy 28, 20, an anxious or closed mind in Job 17, 3 to 4, an evil or restless mind in Ecclesiastes 2, 21 to 23, a rash or deluded mind in Leviticus 5, 4. And the Bible talks about a troubled mind in 2 Kings 6, 11, or a depraved mind in 1 Timothy 6, 5, or a sinful mind in Romans 8, 7. A dull mind in 2 Corinthians 3, 14. A blinded mind in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. A corrupt mind in 2 Timothy 3, 8. And like I said, our minds become broken down by sin. Which means we can't even trust what we do think ourselves, Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so we have um, this amazing ability to be able to lie to ourselves, <laughs> And we can do that. We can, we can tell ourselves things that may not be true. We can tell ourselves that things might be better than they are. Or we can tell ourselves that we're doing okay when we're not doing okay. And we can tell ourselves it's no big deal when it is a big deal. You know, um, the Bible tells us that you cannot be trusted to tell yourself the truth. And that's why you need to question your own thoughts sometimes and not believe everything that you are thinking. Just because you get a thought doesn't mean it's right. And that is the reason why Christians can fall, because sin starts with a lie, doesn't it? The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. And if he can get you to believe a lie, then he can get you to sin. So anytime you're sinning, you're thinking that you know better than God. And God has said this. But what about that? And so you have to question, you know how the enemy comes in. Satan came in, even to Jesus, and he says, have I not said, has the word not said? You know, and, and he just like subliminally just twists something. And you have to question you know, uh, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And, you know, so we can be deceived. We can deceive ourselves because we all have blind spots, don't we? And that is why um, we need to be, we need to hold ourselves accountable to one another, don't we? Because we all have blind spots. And we don't sometimes notice things. And um, we might have maybe some issues, biases, or opinions, or judgments that we don't even realize that these all these filters may be in us, and that we're seeing things through that. 
And so we can get even trapped by our own views of things. And, you know, are you this or are you that? Or, and we even see that going on in our world today, just the polarization of people with their attitudes and judgments. And, and um, you know, we can get tunnel vision and we can miss the whole picture, amen? The big picture. You know, one of the things, I guess, the big reasons why we can't believe everything that we think is we see is what we want to see. Let me say that again. One of the reasons um, why you need not to believe everything you think is that we see what we want to see. You know, and, and I was reading about the brain, you know, and one of the things I, I learned is the optic nerve um, is the nerve, okay, that goes directly into your brain. And it says it actually sends impulses from your brain forward, okay, from rather than from your eye backwards. So think about that, which means your brain is telling you what you see. This is bizarre, right? And so you're always, it says that's why you can, you can put, like say you, there was an accident and there was like three or four different witnesses. That's why every person that saw it would see something different, right? Because everyone's seeing it from their own life uh, experiences. The other thing is, is that, so we, that, don't believe everything you think, okay, is one way to battle. The other way is to guard your mind from garbage. And, you know, we always say garbage in, garbage out. And if you put that kind of, you know, mental garbage into your mind, you're going to have garbage on your life, if that's all you see, right? Proverbs 15, 4 says, a wise person is hungry for knowledge while the, while the fool feeds on trash. And that might be a good post-it note to stick on your, on your fridge, right? Uh, you know, some people just sit in front of the TV and just absorb all this garbage all the time. And you know, even when you talk about even the food and the natural that we put into our bodies in the same way, what are you feeding yourself? I mean, there's good food that's gonna give you life you know, there's just junk food that's just going to be empty calories. And then there's like poison that's going to kill you, you know. And so we're careful. Well, hopefully we try to be somewhat careful what we're putting into our natural bodies, right, so that we're going to live long. Um, I mean, a lot of us <laughs> tend to uh, go after what we like and say what's the best for us, right. But the same with our eyes. What is going in, like many, what's going into our minds? And what we see, what we hear, what we allow into our mind because, um, we need to uh, really look close because God says that we should go and bear fruit. Amen? Be faithful and bear fruit. And if we put that mental garbage into our mind, we're going to get garbage out of the rest of our life, isn't it? Psalm 101 3 says, I will, not, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. And so, how do you guard your mind against garbage? How do you help others guard their mind against this? You know, I heard someone say, you know, some people are so open-minded that their brains fall out. <laughs> it's like they can't allow, uh, or they think they can allow anything to come in without affecting them, and they're going to be fine. But they're just kidding themselves, aren't they? You can't put garbage in your mind and expect it not to affect you. Because, you know what, we are, are the gatekeepers. We're the gatekeepers of what, of what goes in. Psalm 101, 2 to 4 says, I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart it shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. So just think for a second, like, what are you letting into your mind? Because what you let in is going to shape you, right? It's going to... It could or it could open you to attacks uh, on your mind. You know, and a lot of studies have shown the link between, you know, even gaming and heavy metal music and all this different stuff. Can um, there's a there's a correlation between that and, and the suicides that are happening and just even the violence. If all you're seeing is violent, violent murders, murders, you know, um, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So I guess the first thing is we have to just look at what we're putting in. What are we watching? What are we filling our mind with? What do we, we need to guard our mind, amen? But you know, reading the word of God is going to renew your mind. 
But you know, you're still going to suffer attacks on your mind. So when you're renewing your mind, you need to guard it. And how, how can you guard your mind? It says, you know, Philippians 4, 6, 8 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And, okay, so don't just stop there, because it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart. So your heart can be guarded, your mind can be guarded by the peace of God. And your, so it says, which, uh, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And then it says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, and if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And then when we go and have our time of prayer, let the Lord speak to you. Amen? Learn to hear the voice of God. And when you hear Him, okay, your mind can be renewed and you're filled with the peace of God. If you go anxiously to the Lord and just rattle off your list of cares and wants and hopes and dreams, and you're never quiet to let the Lord speak to your heart, you're not going to come away from that time of God being renewed. Amen? God wants to renew our minds. You know, how do we know when we have that peace that passes all our understanding? I guess it's when we get to that place of trying um, to understand, when we get to that place of trying to understand fully what God does, what why God does what he does, and you just come to that place of simply trusting God. Because that is where that peace will guard your mind and your heart. Guarding our heart and mind is also committing things to prayer. Paul says, think about whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure. Think on those kind of things. And he says, pray about everything. You know, if we prayed as much as we worried, you wouldn't have much time to worry, would you? Think about that. It's going to replace that. So don't worry about things. Bring it to God in prayer. And, that, and I'm just talking about having that continuous conversation with God, which means we're not, you know, we're not on our knees, we're not going on our eyes closed, we're not like setting ourselves away somewhere. It's like in our life, every day, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we can be God conscious, amen, 24-7. You know, you can be doing a couple things at once. Like we could, even though you're, you're sitting, you may be listening to me right now, you could still be praying, you could still be doing, you can develop a two-tracked mind, you might say, because it's, you know it says the average person can speak about 150 words a minute, but the average mind can understand 350 words a minute. So there's 200 words there. It says you can actually talk to God and somebody else at the same time. So pray about everything. Have a, a continuous conversation with God. That's why we can be doing a couple things at once, because we've got a couple different tracks going on at once. And the second thing is that um, we should fix our thoughts, amen? It says think on these things. You know, by focusing on things, you know, overcome temptation, don't just resist it, replace it with something. And whatever you resist, persists. And when people say, I don't want to think about this, what are they doing? They're, they're thinking about it, right? <laughs> And whatever gets your focus gets you. And so James tells us, it says, James 1.15 says, sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. So we can't just resist something, we have to replace it. And I think of um, um, just a temptation that can come, you know, with the kids or the grandkids, whatever. If I make cookies and I have them sitting on the counter and they're just coming up eye level and it's like, no, I can't have them right now. And they just look at those cookies, they want them so bad. And next thing you know, they just grab one and they bought it, right? <laughs> they're gonna eat it. And they don't, they can't resist it, right? Um, but you know, in our time, even, you know, with TV, whatever, like change the channel, you know, you know guard your mind, you know? And um, the other thing is never stop learning. Amen, we can learn from anybody. Uh, we just had a, 
I just remember over the years back when we first started out, we were going a couple years with the church, and um, there was a couple, and the fellow came to us, and he said, you know, I think it's just time for me to go now. I just can't learn anything more here. And we're just like, what? You know, it just kind of blew us away because, you know, with, even with the, our family and our kids, our kids were small at the time, and I thought, you know, we could, we're still learning from, you know, our four-year-old daughter here. Like, you can learn from anybody if you have an open mind, amen? And so it showed pride in, in the person's heart, and, and off they went. And, yeah, the next thing you know, they were, they were not doing well because it says was it, pride comes before fall. And so they began to think that they knew more and could, were, they became unteachable. And I think we should always have that place of um, never stop learning. Learn people, learn from people that are older than you, younger than you, um, whatever. Learn from people maybe that don't have the same view as you. Um, you can learn from anybody. Proverbs 18:15 uh, says, "The mind of a smart person is eager to get knowledge, and the wise person listens to learn more." And so God gave us, you know, it says in uh, Proverbs 10:14, it says, "Wise men store up knowledge." And I think, you know, when God gave us, he said, two ears in one mouth, right? It says, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. And so we need to be um, storing up knowledge, it says. Um, don't store up things that are going to decompose and rot and decay on this earth, right? Wisdom from God is going to go with us, amen, into heaven. It's going to be eternal. And store that up. Because it's something you're going to take with you to heaven. You can leave all your other material wealth and all this other stuff. We'll leave it all behind. But what God, what we pray, it says, store up knowledge. You know, I just think of, you know, this last season that we've been in, this last year, the effects of this pandemic, the shutdowns, the isolations, everything. The fear, the loss of business, jobs, homes, whatever. It's taking a toll on society. And statistics are showing that, um, like one in five are experiencing mental illness of some kind. And 45%, uh, it says, will suffer from a diagnosable mental illness at some point in their life. And that's including, that's, that's pretty high, isn't it? That's including like a depression, anxiety, paranoia, um, on and on, different, you know, substance abuse, psychosis, whatever. And it's causing people to lose their jobs, it's causing relationship breakdowns, and divorces and murders and suicides and doctors even believe that over 80% of physical sicknesses are based on the mind. Like blood pressure, diabetes, ulcers, all this kind of thing. And so mental illness or not, you know, pretty much all of us are going to face a battle in our mind with, you know, the advertising that's barraged with <laughs> media, movies, TV, you know, music, whatever and just negativity. And that's the God of the world. Amen? And it's assaulting our hearts and minds every day. And it's trying to manipulate us in order to manipulate our life. So if we can win the battle in our mind, we're going to win the battle of life. Amen? And that's what 2 Timothy 1 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. He's given us a sound mind. And we need to grab a hold of these promises, these scriptures, amen? It's God's will for us to have a sound mind, even with all the pressures of life that I've talked about. And we can be aware. We need to be aware that the enemy is attacking. And we can defeat him. Because his primary target is our mind. Amen? And, you know, when we think of the battlefield, not all uh, targets are the same. And not all victories are are as important as others. And so the enemy, his main target, is a battle for our mind and for our inner peace. And if he can upset that, it opens the door to all these other things. Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And that means that Hebrew word is smack, which means that perfect peace is talking about to lean up against, support, or uphold. And so that verse is saying to lean on God. It says when you're down and you're overwhelmed and you feel like you can't stand, we need to let the Lord support us, amen, and give us peace. 
Because if the enemy can steal the peace, he can win the battle of our mind. But if we lean on the Lord, the enemy becomes powerless to touch us. Amen? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So we can't rely on how we feel. We have to lean on the word of God. Amen? Stand on the word. Who's the word? Jesus. Amen? He's our solid rock. That's who we're standing on. Because the devil's best de deception is to make you so deceived that you can't tell that you are deceived. And so that you don't even know that you have to fight back. And so he comes and he tries to attack because it's the gateway. Your mind is a gateway to your heart and soul. And if he wins that battle, he can neutralize. It's like he paralyzes you and ruins your life and destroys people around you that you love. And so I'd say this is one of the most important things that we need to look at as walking in our walk with the Lord. Strategies. And we need to renew our mind, amen? And just like our, our, account, our computers need to be reset and rebooted sometimes, um, and get constantly updated, if you've got, you know, you know, with your Windows programs, there's all these updates every time, right? Shut down an update, shut down an update. We need to do that with our minds. We need to renew them um, to be constantly updated and renewed with the Word of God. Because otherwise, we can get led astray. We can start conforming to the world, can't we? Just because we're around, we're not around the Word of God. If you take that out and you just start to, to listen to all the narratives and all the different things that are going on, we can soon be drawn in the wrong direction. But Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. And so that means that he wants, God wants to mold us, and that's, that's how uh, the enemy tries to come, and he tries to squeeze, and, and he tries to mold us into the way of the world. And to conform us into his thinking. But God says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. You know, you just, um, you just realize, <laughs> you just have to go on like social media or whatever and put something on there against, maybe say against abortion or against gay marriage or whatever it is. And within five minutes, you're going to be, um, seeing people trying to mold you into their way of thinking, amen? Um, the Greek word is, is talking about renewing, to make new again, to conform your thinking, to make it God's thinking. And it's a choice, amen? To be molded into the way that God thinks, to be molded into God's image is a choice. And how do you renew your mind? You get in the word of God, you read the word of God, you come to be with one another at church, and you let God's word fill you, amen? You grab a hold of his promises like that anchor to give you hope and to regenerate you and to line you back up. You know, I was thinking like in Israel, there's two, two lakes or seas, and they're both fed by the Jordan River. And it says the Galilee has fresh, clean water, and it's full of life and fish. And the Dead Sea is exactly that, dead. It's dead. It has high concentrations of salt in it, right? And nothing lives in or even near the Dead Sea. And it says, what's the difference? Because Galilee has an outflow, so the waters are constantly renewed. And the Dead Sea has no outflow, and it's never renewed. And so it just goes, it goes dead. And so we need to be constantly flowing in the things of God, allowing his word to flow in us, amen? And, um, you know, getting in the word of God, renewing our minds, and putting godly things in. Amen? Um, and I just have a couple, one more thing. Um, being accountable to one another. Um, iron sharpens iron, doesn't it? as one man sharpens another. So stay stay together uh, with people. And it's a great way to guard our mind as we stay together with people who love us. Amen? It's, 
staying positive in these times too. Um, we need to watch what we are aligning with. <laughs> you know, when we're, when we're under attack too, you're gonna notice that, you know, negative thoughts start coming up and we start talking these things out of our mouth, don't we? And we need to watch our mouth and what we say to make sure that we stay lined up uh, positive and, um, you know, like I've always said, Christians are like a tea bag, right? Their true colors come out when they put in hot water. And <laughs> things are heating up and things are coming out. And we need to make sure that they are lined up with God. Amen? We need to stay positive. Um, in, uh, and then taking every thought captive uh, is really important. That was the, um, if you're trying to stay positive and you're trying to, you know, fill your mind with good, godly things, it's a battle, amen? And sometimes the enemy is going to win a battle or two here and there. And uh, winning, we need to be steady, okay? Because we need to be consistent. We have to be constantly on guard, amen? Because when you think you have the enemy just all figured out, right, and you can recognize his influence, you know, he may sneak up in another way and bombard you because he's a cheat and he doesn't play fair, is he? He's always got his um, little strategies going on. Second Corinthians, it says, like I read at the beginning when we started today, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but have that power to destroy strongholds. And we're talking about the strongholds of our minds today because we want to destroy every high and lofty thing that tries to set itself up against the knowledge of Christ. You know, because those negative thoughts are going to come into even the most positive minds, right? And when they enter, take them captive. Amen? Make them obedient to Christ. Don't entertain them. Don't invite them, you know, for dinner <laughs> or for tea to stay with you. Say, you know, I'm not going to listen to you because Jesus says, I'm more than a conqueror, so you have no effect. You know, it's time to take the word of God and begin to use it. Amen? We've got to in this hour. And I want to conclude today with just staying focused on Jesus. You know, when Peter stepped out of the boat, his eyes were on Jesus. Amen? And his mind was filled with faith, and he walked on the water. And then he looked around, and the winds and the waves, you know, Satan attacked his mind, and he began to falter. And he started to doubt, and he started to sink, didn't he? And you can look at that in Matthew 14, 29. It says, Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. He began to sink and cry, Lord, save me. And then Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And so, you know, the key, the last key here I wanted to share this morning is to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, Amen. Don't look at those circumstances. Don't listen to negativity. Whatever you're going through right now, and I'm sure every one of us are going through different things, we can win the battle of our mind by focusing on Jesus. And Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so today I know that we can win the battle for our minds. Amen? I know that many of you may be, may be facing huge, huge battles in your mind. Maybe sin is tempting you or negative thoughts or unforgiveness might be controlling you. Or maybe you just have some huge things that you're dealing with and you just can't seem to break through or can't seem to get out of your negativity. But I just want to tell you today that you can win the battle for your mind. I just want to quote um, Pastor Scott Apke. Uh, he put a, a quote on uh, Facebook the other day and he, see, he said, tell us what you're for, not what you're against. When you communicate you're believing for it makes you do not believe 
It makes what you do not believe very obvious. When people dwell on and communicate only what they're against, they release unbelief and negativity. In doing that, they create a spiritual atmosphere that brings harm to themselves and, and those in their sphere of influence. It's a spiritual world. Belief and unbelief are powerful forces. Use the amazing force of belief that is in you to bring blessing to you and those around you. And so with our taking the word of God and, and lining ourselves up with his promises and grabbing a hold of hope, it will bring us to that place of faith and renewing our minds, amen? And I know that many here may struggle to stay positive and fill your mind with good things, but today is a day that we need to say, devil, enough, amen? We are choosing to fix our eyes on you, Lord, and we are choosing to take negative and destructive thoughts captive. We are choosing to take all those vain imaginations and pull them down. We're choosing to renew our mind with good and godly things because we are going to win the battle for our minds. Amen? So if you're struggling with thoughts that seem to have power over you, I just want to pray this morning. Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we have walked through your word today and we have seen that you care about our minds. You've addressed with hundreds of scriptures, Lord, and you care about the condition, the health of our mind, uh, and that you would want us to be fruitful and faithful and be able to uh, use our minds, Father, and that they would be uh, not held captive by the enemy. And so today, Father, we just uh, break every stronghold that is trying to assault the minds of the believers. Father, whether it's um, lies they have believed from the enemy, whether it's um, situations that they've been in that are facing, whatever it is that is coming at them, whether it's depression that is trying to press them down during this time, uh, whatever it is, Lord, today, Father, I pray that they would be able to give those things over to you, Father, in a place of uh, just coming, simply repenting right now. If there's, if they've let uh, maybe unforgiveness be harbored in their heart or anything that would block the flow uh, in their hearts this morning. And, they, and Lord, just that renewing and the grace to guard our minds uh, would just be so uh, loud in our spirits in this hour, Lord, that we would uh, know what it is to be in that full armor of God with, with that helmet of salvation and uh, we would have that sword of the spirit, the word of God, so in that belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, Lord, and our, our feet shod with the gospel of Christ, and that we would just be secure in your promises, Lord, that that hope that you have given us, Lord, would be so, we would grab a hold of that, that hope that you promise, that peace would guard and mount guard of our mind and spirit and soul. And so we pray that today, that you would bring us into perfect alignment, Lord, that you would bring us into that place of peace that passes all our natural understanding, and that you would grace us and help us, Holy Spirit, to be ones that would be God-conscious 24-7, and we would just talk and walk with you, Lord, and, and repent along the way and just experience the fullness of of your promises living out in our life. And we thank you for that today, Father. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over the minds of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen.